When people meet Katie, they usually want to know two things. They want to know, first, hey, what's her deal? What's her issue? It's no secret. She acts very differently. And they want to know, you know, what's going on. It's not something that we can just brush off. Katie behaves differently. And then the other thing that they want to know right away is, wow, how did this happen to her? So I'm here to tell you the whole story of Katie. Hey, I'm Michelle Hayes, special education teacher and parent of a child with multiple special needs. I'm here to share stories, strategies, inspiration, and hope to parents and caregivers of individuals with disabilities. Because when life requires us not to be normal, it becomes our opportunity to turn into something extraordinary. Welcome to the journey. Okay, so what is going on with Katie? Let me tell you, Katie suffered brain damage as a baby, and this happened as a result of a metabolic condition. Because of this, Katie developed some significant cognitive challenges. Cognitive, so like anything that we have to perform, whether it be uh, mental or physical, it's just all challenging for Katie. Um, she also has autism-like characteristics. Uh, she's got the ADHD. <laughs> she's got the anxiety. She has sensory processing disorder. All those kind of things that um, make up what normally gets categorized as autism. She has social deficiencies. She has pretty significant language delays. And, well, we just call it autism. So that way people understand. Katie has epilepsy and she's had it since she was an infant, like a little baby. And it's just something she's always had to battle with. So let me walk you through from conception to birth. And let me back up a little bit and tell you a little bit about myself and my husband. So my husband and I were married in December of 1999. Yes, we got married a few days before the turn of the millennium. So we got to live through the whole Y2K experience and literally turning a millennium. And uh, we were married and working and going through college. And about three years after we had been married, we decided that we were going to go work with my husband's parents who were missionaries. And we we moved with uh, his family to Mexico, and that's where we were working, doing um, all sorts of stuff. I was working in multimedia. My husband, Isaac, was doing a lot of like uh, international um, leadership courses, things like that. Hey, but we had been married three years, and we were ready to have kids. So we wanted kids. He was ready. I was ready. And uh, we found out that we had infertility. And so we continued to try for a bit to have babies. And eventually we just said, hey, you know what? Let's go see a doctor. And turned out that I had infertility issues and he had infertility issues. And so it was a double whammy. But finally, after a lot of fear and a lot of tears, we found out in uh, January of 2005 that we were expecting our first child and we were over the moon. We were just so ready. So the, the nine months went along and I had a scheduled C-section and here's how it went. <laughs> we got to the hospital, we drove up. It was a scheduled C-section because I had several complications and maybe I'll go into it another time. When I got to the hospital, the nurses took me, put me in a wheelchair, took me up into the elevator and they started doing the prep for the C-section. And then they left my husband alone. He, and he was in the lobby and he ended up doing all the paperwork stuff. Now in Mexico... Uh, you have to pay for your birth ahead of time. So if you're going to have a baby, um, you start making 
payments and you have to pay in full by the time you are going to deliver your child. So you have to make sure that you have full payment for your birth before you actually give birth. We had already paid. We'd been paying every month during my pregnancy and while I was getting prepped for the C-section, the nurses there started walking my husband through the options for the packages we could have. And so some packages were like, okay, you can have this suite with the, you know, the extra space available for the spouse to sleep in, or you could have metabolic testing that is much more extensive, or you could have, um, blood cord banking, which is like for cancer kind of situations. So you could, um, you know, preserve that. And my husband said, well, what's this metabolic thing? And the nurses reassured him that a very, very rare percentage of people ever have this metabolic condition and that he should have nothing to worry about. So Isaac went ahead and just got us a nice, comfortable room and then went upstairs to see uh, his baby be born. Now, when Katie was born, she was born just wide awake. She was looking around, making eye contact. Uh, everything was wonderful. And in that hospital, she was engaging and, and just acting beautifully. Um, the doctors released us. Everybody was healthy. We were good to go. Now, as we went home, the days progressively started getting harder and harder so Katie could not latch on for breastfeeding and there was this never-ending crying now we knew to expect exhaustion we knew that sleepless nights were coming we knew that we were going to be interrupted but Katie never actually rested like she would fall asleep so lightly and she wouldn't go into deep sleep and she would cry and cry there was no sleep and by the time she was 10 weeks old she got incredibly sick we hospitalized her found out that she had a respiratory infection and she had a intestinal issue rotavirus she was super sick it was intense and so my husband and I were thinking, you know what? She's just a newborn. We're going to get through this. It's going to wear off. Will it wear off? Four months. Katie's four months old. Things are not getting any easier. She's still acting like a newborn. She's still not resting. She's not sleeping. Her eyes were turning purple from being so exhausted. And she was never happy or content or at peace. There were no smiles. We mentioned it to the doctor and the doctor was like, oh, you know, it's just colic. It's colic. Don't worry about it. You're a first time mom. Trust me, he would say. We decided, OK, hey, let's, let's do this fun thing. Let's introduce solid foods. But... Katie, I remember my mom sent us, my mom was far away in another country and she shipped us a high chair and I, I felt weird because that high chair seemed so inappropriate for Katie. It was a really fancy, nice high chair, but Katie wouldn't sit up or hold her trunk or, or, or hold her head hardly up. She would just kind of flop over. And I had to, I remember that to introduce her solid food, I had to lean that high chair way back so that she was kind of you know, resting her back and not falling over. So I went ahead and fed her that way. And I remember it was bananas and she didn't really have a reaction. Like she was just kind of swallowing the food and not acting surprised or shocked or anything. At that time, she was four months old and she wouldn't engage with people, you know, making eye contact, smiling. She wouldn't look around, explore her surroundings. It's like she had this kind of glazed look that kept increasing and increasing. So a few more months go by, she's six months old and she still has no core strength. And then she started having these weird spasms. She would like jerk her arms up and her knees up suddenly and her eyes would bulge like it was a great surprise but I thought you know what it's just one of those newborn reflexes you know when they're falling asleep and suddenly they act like they had a dream that they were falling and I thought that was it you know but it just seemed to increase more and more and by the time she was eight months old all she did was just lay in bed she would lay in bed and I remember that 
At the time, we thought it was cute. Now that I understand what was going on, it breaks my heart. But she would lay in bed and she would like do the splits. So she would have one foot on one side of the crib and the other foot on the other side of the crib. And I just thought she was a funny sleeper. Later, I came to understand that she was so dizzy that she was doing that just to feel some sort of bearings, you know, and her spasms were just worsening. I remember that I took her to the store one time in the stroller and it was just a hard day. I had to go over a little step and when I had to tilt the stroller, she nearly fell out of the stroller. I remember being super embarrassed because people were watching and I felt like the most horrible mother. And I mean, she was buckled in. She was, you know, that five point harness, she, she had it, but her muscle tone was so low and her her engagement with the world was so not there that she just she just started falling out of the stroller I had to catch her grab the stroller put her back in I remember I just went to the store to buy like one or two things because I I really needed them and the store was like one block away so I just walked and I remember standing in line at the store and she started getting those spasms but they happened all the time like all the time and so while I was waiting in line, I remember there was this man, okay? It wasn't even a woman. It wasn't a mother. It was like a guy. And he freaked out. He saw Katie, and he he's like pointing to her and then telling me, hey, look at your child. Look at your child. Your child. Something's wrong with your child. And I looked at him dismissively because we were used to seeing these kind of spasms and she was very small. And I said, oh, don't worry. It's just a little reaction that she has. And he did not look appeased with my answer. He kept looking at her and he had like this um, alarm stare. It's like he wanted to do something. And when I when I think back, I still kick myself. I'm like, there are so many, so many signs. And I thought she was okay because my pediatrician told me she was okay at every month checkup. So time went on. She was 11 months old. And we took a trip. We took a trip to Cancun. Yeah, without sleeping through the night, with all the spasms. I was trying to be as normal as I could. And I honestly thought that I just sucked as a mom. I thought, I can't hold it together. I can't just get used to this. I am not understanding how to parent. And this is just, I suck at being a mom. And so I decided I was going to go ahead and take this trip to Cancun. I went with my mother-in-law and it was for a women's conference. So we were surrounded by women who were already moms, who many of them had already raised their babies into teenagers or even adults. And I got to share a lot of space with these ladies, you know, like hotel rooms and lobbies. And so they got to see the spasms themselves and they got to see how often it happened. So not just once or twice, but they got to see it. And then I I remember they would just gather around and they were all very alarmed. And they said, Michelle, this is this is not normal. She should be first. She should be able to stay awake for more than two hours, which Katie would fall asleep. By the way, she would get these spasms. They would knock her super tired. She would fall asleep for a little bit, wake up, have another cluster of spasms, go back to sleep. And that was Katie's life. And so um, they, they were telling me, okay, first by 11 months, your daughter's about to be a year old. She should be able to be awake. She should be able to sit up and she should not be looking like this with these spasms. Something is wrong. And I remember that we had like a beautiful suite in Cancun. And I remember that we had a big balcony. And I remember opening those windows and holding my baby spasm after spasm after spasm. Now coming to the full realization, there's something wrong with my baby and just freaking out and having nothing that I could do. I'm starting to think this is epilepsy. There's something wrong with her. And I remember opening those curtains to this beautiful scenery in Cancun. And I remember looking at that beach and hating, hating the beach. And I remember just telling the beach, I'm like, Cancun can have its beaches. I just want my baby. And we just spent the time, you know, as much as we could trying to be normal, having seizures every two hours. We came back home and 
they did some testing on Katie. We did um, an EEG, which is um, a test where they check out those waveforms and the brainwave patterns. It turns out that uh, the doctor did spot what he called infantile spasms. That's what he diagnosed her with. He said, your child is having infantile spasms. We are going to try to get to the source of the problem, and we are going to try to solve this problem. So my husband and I thought, oh, the word spasms, no big deal. Um, we're going to make them stop. So we went back home. I remember we put Katie to bed. My husband fell asleep, and I just laid in bed, and I thought, just like so many of you guys, <laughs> Let me Google infantile spasms. And I went to Google and I typed infantile spasms. And my world started spinning out of control. This was the moment where I was like, I, I, I still don't know how I made it, you know, to where I am right now. Because what I read was so devastating. Every single thing I read about infantile spasms, otherwise known as West syndrome, otherwise known as a severe form of infantile epilepsy. And what I read said 90% of infants who suffer from West syndrome or these infantile spasms turn out to be severely intellectually disabled. And I remember literally just my world just spinning. The, the feeling in my gut cannot be described. Just like a big heavy stone was pulling down at my stomach. And I was so scared. I was so terrified that I was dizzy with fear. I was holding onto the desk and I felt like I couldn't get enough air. I cannot describe I cannot describe, but if you've had your child diagnosed, you might relate. I remember just thinking, can somebody please fix my baby? I couldn't believe that happened to our baby. We were the parents that wanted a child. We were the parents that were ready. We were the parents that were missionaries. Why? You know, those thoughts came to my head. Eventually, um, they started poking and prodding Katie to try to figure out what was wrong. We couldn't find it, couldn't find it. Eventually they did um, do a metabolics exam. And when Katie was 13 months, so just one month over a year, she was diagnosed with something called phenylketonuria. <laughs> it's still hard for me to pronounce. Phenylketonuria. Yes. Okay. It's phenylketonuria. And in Spanish, fenilcetonuria, which is why I struggle so much with pronouncing it. Uh, we found out that uh, the acronym for phenylketonuria is picayune. We found out that uh, this whole shebang of issues that Katie had been going through were totally avoidable, easily, cheap, $20 test. All they had to do was run that freaking metabolics test at birth. Yeah, the one that nurses said, oh, just a small percentage. You guys look healthy. You guys are fine. You shouldn't worry about it. The test that we passed up on, that test would have saved Katie. And what it would have done is they would have said, oh, your child has this PKU condition. Guess what? That means that your child can't eat protein. Now, protein is normally healthy for everybody, but for people with PKU, protein is toxic and it turns into poison and it damages the brain. So the more you consume protein, the more brain damage you can incur. But don't worry, this condition has been diagnosed and treated since the 1960s and we have a solution. We're going to give her a supplemental formula and we're going to avoid protein and she'll grow up to be whatever she wants to be. That's how it should have played out, except... They didn't run that metabolic test, except they left the choosing to my husband, except they told us, oh, it's just a small percentage and you don't look like someone who would carry that. So we thought, let's try to turn this around. Let's get her treated. What do we do? They said, OK, well, we're going to restrict protein and we're going to give her that supplemental formula. And let me tell you something. Katie had been eating already regular food. She was a year old, so she was already having meat. She was already having pasta. So overnight, 
we had to remove all those things. I'm like, what is low protein? This is such a rare condition that no one in Mexico really knew. They told me, well, pineapples are low in protein and onions. So feed her that. So I'm feeding my one-year-old onions and pineapples. And they're like, oh, we're going to order that formula for you. And she's going to be hungry until it gets here. Don't give her any more protein because you're going to give her more brain damage. And so... I was holding out for that formula and Katie wouldn't eat. It was just, I can't explain to you how hard that was. And we waited about two weeks to finally get that formula in. And I was so excited. I'm going to give this nutrition. My child is going to change. And when I finally gave her the formula, guess what? When you mess with amino acids, when you modify a protein, things taste bad. And I gave Katie the formula and she immediately rejected it. I was crushed. They talked about, well, we got to get this in her. So how about a G-tube, which is like a tube that you put in the stomach? I'm like, no. And I started force feeding Katie. And I did that until she finally accepted the formula. It took about eight months. We started therapies. Um, she needed physical therapy so that she could learn to sit up, which she learned when she was about yeah, 15 months independently and then she had to learn to stand and to crawl she started crawling when she was she was a year and a half and finally they said well let's see maybe she'll walk maybe she won't when they first diagnosed her they said we don't guarantee that she will ever walk the damage has been pretty extensive so my husband and I were aching to see her walk I can't explain to you the bitterness I felt just watching parents raise their children and their babies just did stuff. Their babies just walked. I remember one time I was walking down the street and I saw a stray dog. I mean, my thoughts went dark places, dark places. I saw a stray dog and the dog was walking. And I remember being bitterly jealous that a street dog could learn to walk. But my daughter did not have that guarantee. And it just made me so angry and hurt. But eventually... After lots and lots of therapies, when Katie was just a little over two and a half years old, she took her first very wobbly steps. And I cannot tell you how much that meant to us, that she was going to be a walker, that she could walk. And we were over the moon. We're like, okay, and just like... A few months we've made some recoveries we've made some recoveries so when she turned three years old I thought I've got to get this child of mine in a school she needs to get socially adopted we need to have some early interventions now remember we were in Mexico and we could not find a school that would take her in I tried I remember I tried 16 schools and it was always the same thing well we are not prepared to have a child like yours uh, we don't work with special needs children we don't have the staff it was stuff like that and I remember I finally found an amazing beautiful private school and they said uh, okay we'll let her come to class with us but you need to you need to bring your own private duty nurse and she's going to be the one working with her with your daughter and also um, you're going to have to pay tuition and I remember the tuition per month was more than like the rent that we were paying so it wasn't even an option like we couldn't afford it we were missionaries okay we didn't even know when our next check would come or where our money would come from because missionaries don't have that financial security and um, that was where we were at. We uh, started thinking a lot about what was best for our family and we decided that Katie really needed to be included into you know schools and education and and we needed to expect more so we decided to go ahead and pack and move back to the United States, and we did. We are all U.S. citizens, so the transition back into the United States was relatively a breeze, and we ended up getting Katie evaluated right away. She qualified for special education services, and we enrolled her in a program for children with disabilities called PPCD, which stands for Preschool Program for Children with Disabilities. Once she was enrolled, I needed a source of income. We all uh, needed to find new jobs because we were no longer missionaries in Mexico. Now we needed to find 
like civilian jobs, I guess you would say. And I thought that if I could only work for a school, then I could keep kind of the same schedule and I could take care of Katie and I could have the same kind of, you know, days off, vacation days, all that kind of stuff. And so I applied for the school where she was enrolled in and I was hired. I was hired as an instructional paraprofessional, which is just like a teacher's assistant. And, uh, They moved me around a bit because I honestly was awful. I didn't know what I was doing. My background was in television and radio, and there was no training. I just kind of like jumped in, and I wasn't the right fit for a couple of classrooms. And looking back on it, I can see why, but I I didn't know back then what I know now. Anyway, all this to say, I ended up getting moved around, and they ended up putting me in a PPCD classroom in that school, which was not Katie's classroom. Katie's classroom kept growing and growing. It got so big that it had to be split into two classrooms and they had to get another teacher. And so they put me working as that teacher's assistant. But we got to share a lot of the same kind of schedule. So like the playground schedule, the PE schedule, the lunch schedule. So inadvertently, I ended up sharing a lot of my work time with my own child, which was incredible and weird because I felt like people thought maybe I was policing her or that I had, you know, signed up to work where I worked just so I could keep an extra close watch. And honestly, that was not the case, but that's how it ended up playing out. Well, about six months into it, I thought, you know, why don't I just figure out what it takes to become a special education teacher because I really, really, really want to work with special needs children. I don't want to just help Katie. I want to help Katie and others. You know, if I'm going to walk this path, then let me bring as many as I can bring behind me. If we're going to open new territories, let me bring people with me, not just my child, but everybody's child. I fell in love with the special needs community. I fell in love with the special needs babies. And I wanted to believe that everyone can heal and that everyone can improve, that everyone can learn. So I decided to go ahead and do the studying that it took to become certified in special education and as a regular teacher. And I remember I would take my lunch breaks and I would study during my lunch breaks and I would stay up late at night, you know, like a lot of people do. And I ended up just taking my exams and passing them all. And by the end of the school year, I was certified as a special education teacher, which turned into just a real opportunity for me because at that time our school uh, population, our special needs population in our school kept growing. So they ended up having to open up more classrooms for special education students. So in the summer, they opened up another classroom in a different school where they were going to move all these kiddos that I had been working with because they just didn't fit in that, in that school anymore. So they were going to transitioned them over to another campus with a brand new classroom and they needed to hire a teacher and that's when I took the opportunity I applied for work I said I already know these kids I've been working with them for a year I would like to be considered as the teacher for this position for this school and I was hired and that's how I ended up becoming a special ed teacher then I was able to move my daughter into the school where I worked and Katie ended up being my own student in my own PPCD classroom, which was just such an answer to prayer. When Katie got rejected for the last time in Mexico, when I said, this is the last rejection, I wrote down in my journal and it was really interesting. I never paid any attention to it until later I was leafing through and I was just writing. I was venting and so I was praying and I was talking to God and I was saying, you know, she keeps getting rejected. These people don't know how much she's overcome. They don't understand. They just keep labeling her. They keep judging her. They turn her away. And here's one more school that turned her away. So I am just going to assume that until a school takes her in, that I'm supposed to be Katie's teacher. 
And I prayed to have all the wisdom that it took and all the preparation that it took to become Katie's teacher and to be the best that I could be for her, which turned into like a really symbolic kind of journal entry because, I mean, not even a year after I had written all that down, I was literally Katie's teacher. But before that, I was also Katie's assistant teacher. So I never stopped teaching my child. I never did. And I just got the blessing of being able to not just teach my own child, not just learn, but to work with so many other children who just need a boost, who just need an adaptation, who just need understanding, who just need a different way of communicating. Each child so unique, so different, so wonderful and so special. And I was just so blessed to be trusted to work with these kiddos. That brings us to today, 2020, the year of the coronavirus pandemic. (laughs) We're all changing our lives dramatically. We're all having to find new ways of doing things we've done all the time. And me as a teacher, I've had to find new ways to do things too. I thought I was going on spring break. I was looking forward to just having that one week off. And that one week off so far has turned into six months. And during this time, I've had to learn to teach remotely from home, from my computer, and to teach special education early learners from home. And as a result, I've done a whole lot of new learning and I've done a whole lot of new growing. So I've started a YouTube channel for my students. I've found a lot of different technological ways to get connected with my kids. And now it brings me to this. Hey, I can make videos. I can reconnect with multimedia. I have my multimedia background and guess what? I've been listening to podcasts for more than a decade. I've been wanting to create my own. Now I've got the tools. I've got the venues. I'm just going to jump in. And so here I am. I've jumped in just like I did at the beginning, just like I've been doing all the time. I'm just jumping in and I'm finding myself with water above my head and I'm learning to swim in new waters. And it's just... um. That's just what I'm going to do every day, all my life. I am just going to keep swimming, just keep swimming. I think that I can provide you guys with a lot of unique perspectives because I have a background from both sides of the fence. So I can see everything from the perspective of a special needs parent But I can also see things from the perspective of the special education teacher. And I can't wait to connect with you guys. So what now? So here's the plan for season one. It's called Driving Conclusions. And it's going to be a very intimate, personal perspective. I'm going to be sharing with you guys a lot of the things that I've written in my journal over the last 15 years. And I am going to let you in on some of the key moments, processes, and deciding factors and values that have driven me to where I am today and that have continued to propel me forward. So the whole season one of this podcast is going to be all about that. I can't wait to share it with you. And hopefully you can find some, uh, perspectives that you can relate with. Uh, Maybe you can find some comfort knowing that you're not alone in the process that you're going through, that, that I've been through it, if no one else. And I'm just really happy that you're here. For the next episode, I am going to be talking to you about battling depression after your child's diagnosis. I certainly went through some depression and I want to tell you all about that how I've overcome and how I continue to overcome because in the special needs parenting realm depression can be ongoing and I want to share with you my stories my strategies and the things that have gotten me through battling depression thanks for tuning in I hope to see you back for episode two and share more of our story with you until next time